Right then, good morning guys. Um, today we're going to be doing uh, another Sculpt for Crystal Collapse. So, uh, last year we worked on a couple of these figures. So we've done uh, the Evil King. So this is... Uh, I can't remember what we call him now. He was called Lucifer, but I think his name's changed now. It might be Luca. So it's King Luca uh, from the Kingdom of Varland. Um, so <coughs> this guy is... Um, he's basically a prince who uh, gets corrupted by these crystals and the crystals um, are basically like eggs that contain a god um, and he, he sees one and it kind of drives him into madness and he kind of is determined he's going to kind of harvest all the crystals and collect them um, <clears throat> in the story uh, one of the crystals kind of like cracks and opens up and the god is released and kind of doing its thing um, but when the gods come out of the eggs they're not at full power so they're kind of um, what's the word they can kind of be challenged and attacked and uh, they've got to kind of build up their power to become a god again <clears throat> morning bonker how you doing mate so, uh, so this guy is um, let's say he gets corrupted by the crystals. He sees uh, sees it up close. The crystal explodes. The shards of the crystal end up kind of getting scattered far and wide. And he wants to go out and collect all the shards of the crystal back in for um, you know like a power grab. Um, so driven mad by this kind of crystal exposure, he goes off <clears throat> and he starts um, trying to invade his neighbours. And his dad's not very happy about it. His dad's the king, obviously. Um, tries to put a stop to it uh, long and short of it is he ends up killing his dad and ascending the throne so this guy then becomes King Luca of the Kingdom of Ireland <coughs> so um, in the game itself you'll be playing him as the king um, and he is using the calling it the empire basically he expands his kingdom into an empire off the back of uh, kind of aggressive invasions into his neighbours who starts conquering um, his neighbouring countries and nations and whatnot. Um, creates this like the, the typical JRPG trope really of the, the evil empire um, and they're all on this like mad mission to to get the, uh, the, the crystals in <clears throat> so whilst this guy is evil the rest of the characters in the empire aren't necessarily so uh, we've got him, we've got Fina, who was the last one I sculpted on stream. Uh, I need to pose her yet still, so she's got to be um, put into position, but we'll deal with that later on. Today we're going to get the sculpt done for uh, Mr. Powder. So Mr. Powder, let me just grab the reference up on screen. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Powder is... One of the soldiers for the uh, Kingdom of Ireland, basically. He's like a sniper, or he appears to be a sniper. Um, <clears throat> but actually, in game, he's technically a magic user. So here he is up on screen. This is the guy we're going to be sculpting today. <clears throat> Let's move him into position on the right. So this is the guy we're going to be sculpting. Uh, he is uh, wielding this magical rifle. So, um, oh yeah, let's get a picture of him. There he is. <coughs> so he's he's, got, he's waving around his magical rifle. Um, it doesn't fire normal bullets; it fires like bolts of magic. So when he hits you in game, it doesn't count. Things like things like the, the facing of the model don't count. It doesn't matter where he hits you. It's kind of like if you get hit by a bullet in the front or the back, whatever it is, your arm is going to protect you or it's not going to protect you, depending on the angle of impact and whatever. Um, with this guy, he's basically firing like bolts of magic out of his gun. If he hits you with a bolt of magic, he hits you with a bolt of magic. Um, so it doesn't matter which direction he hits you from, um, what elevation he hits you from, there's no bonuses for it, it's just a flat, you hit and you're taking damage. Um, 
he can also amplify his magic and he can charge it up and uh, like fire a power blast <clears throat> so he's very useful single shots on their own are not hugely effective but when you spend a little bit of time powering them up and charging them up um, uh, this guy becomes an absolute monster so uh, he's really worth spending the time to try and um, get him into a good position where he's got line of sight to uh, quite a lot of enemies and um, let's say start charging up his his magic attack so uh, when he unleashes it he unleashes it at maximum maximum power <clears throat> right then so first thing I need for this guy is a base mesh to start with oh and then the other character we've done so far as well was Corrado um, that's him unposed there he is. This is Corrado posed up. So he's the uh, he's the kind of the counterpart of um, Lucifer. So he's a good guy. Uh, he's uh, I want to say he's like a paladin kind of knight, but he's like he's raw power. This guy is like massive, great big sword. He is all about the attack. And then we've got his brother Roland, who he'll be decked out similarly. He'll have similar armor. Um, except you'll be wielding two different swords and we'll do two versions of uh, Roland so um, one version will have a sword like this uh, and uh, a single handed sword and the other one's going to have two single handed swords <coughs> and Roland is basically the although I said he's the kind of like the counterpart to um, Luca or Lucifer um, Corrado is not the the leader. Um, the younger brother Roland is the uh, is the one who's going to be become the king. Essentially, I don't know if he's going to become the king. He's he's the leader of the faction anyway. So uh, I've had a chat to Max. We're going to do a repose on Corrado. I'm not quite happy with that pose. We're going to rework that and uh, make it a little bit better. Possibly, I mean, the original pose was. I mean, this is this is the original sculpt of Roland and Corrado. So you can see Roland's here with his two swords. Corrado's there with a big sword. Um, probably going to use a similar pose to what we used here for the Corrado sculpt. Um, uh, and as for Roland, the pose may not be dissimilar to that, to be honest. Um, but yeah, we'll see. We'll see how he goes. So, uh, today's sculpt then, I need a, a base model to start working with. <coughs> so, I'll just bring one in. Or do I have one in here? No, I'll just import one. Okay. Um, Load tool, base mesh. <coughs> okay. So I just need to double check because we rescaled the proportions a little bit on the other guys. Oh, this is one of the standard infantry we're going to use for the uh, for the Imperial troops. Oh, no, for the House Bazaaria troops, sorry. To emerge visible on this one, so I can use, I can drop him in as a scale reference.
looking about right. Okay, so for Mr. Powder, first thing we're going to do is duplicate the body form. So the second one we're going to use for actually building the uh, the layers onto. So legs first. Let's do his trousers. One second. So, trousers. Yeah, yeah, good thanks, mate. Good thanks. Been a little bit groggy, but <coughs> I'll message you offline and talk about that, but um yeah just tired man tired a bit aching but it's that time of year and the, the the dark mornings are tough aren't they trying to trying to get up and get ready and get the kids sorted and all that kind of stuff it's, it's hard going it's hard going anyway but then when it's it's cold and dark out it's it's 10 times harder <coughs> so should be a bit of an early finish today i think i, I need to knock it on here about one two o'clock at the latest so how are you today you keeping well mate Temperatures on a, on a down, downward uh, downward turn again, isn't it at the moment? They're threatening this uh, beast from the east too, aren't they? So we'll see, we'll see what happens. But definitely feels colder today. Had a real annoyance yesterday. The uh, the sculpt of the Troger that I was doing on stream, I got him all supported up, put him on a, a test print, and then left it for the night and kind of went went in the house. Um, kind of got settled for the evening. <coughs> and um, when I was coming back into the office this morning, I've got absolutely nothing on my bill plate um, on my printer, but I've also got nothing on the FEP. So the printers run for uh, like six or seven hours to do this print, and hasn't even printed anything. And it's my Epax X1 printer that does this, and I've got a feeling that when I did the upgrade, I may not have plugged something in correctly. And it always annoys me. It's like a constant headache because I never know if it's going to kind of work or not. You have to test it first, test the screen, and then put it on, and hope for the best. And it's, it seems to be like a 50-50, 50-50 whether or not it actually fires up and does its job. So I think I'm going to get a little Kickstarter running soon, and then all being well, off the back of the Kickstarter, I'll buy another printer or two to replace it, probably something reliable. You managed to. Talk the wife into letting you have one yet, Bunker? You gotta wait for the weather to warm up so you can. Uh... Yeah, resin's fine. Um, I mean, it's a new. I've opened a new bottle, and it's not. I tend to get through it fast enough that it's not going to be sitting around. But I have had resin bottles sitting around for like, you know, twelve months opened. And they're still all right to use. You just have to really mix them well together. So you basically got a couple of different components in there. So you'll have like a, a, a pigment component. You'll have the um, like the actual resin body, and then you'll have the activator, the, the UV activator stuff. <coughs> and basically, all of those components need to be thoroughly mixed because 
the resin is going to work as a as a complete body. Um, if you get the proportions of the activator and the resin body and the pigments and stuff out, then the chemical balance of the resin is going to be off, and you're not going to get the same kind of effects. It might take longer to cure. It might take less time to cure, and you know you get all these kind of things. But um, as long as you make sure your resin is like properly thoroughly mixed in then uh, you should never have any real issues with it even if it's a bit of an older bottle I think they say 12 months 12 months life uh, shelf life on the resin but you know I think if you're using it and um, I mean the reality is if you're printing stuff you're probably going to get through it aren't you <clears throat> I mean, a litre of resin, you'll get probably, I don't know, 100 or more models out of that. Easy. If you're printing bigger stuff, say 60 or so, but, you know, I don't think many people will struggle to get that, those kind of uh, quantities of models done if you're a proper hobbyist, you know what I mean? Make nice. To be honest, if I'm not sure, I'm not even sure how big the screen is on the Mono 4K, um, but I believe it's on par with like the Sonic Mini 4K. Um, so if you've got a six-inch build plate, actually, it's, it's big enough to print most things. Like that, that Troga, <coughs> the Troga I did yesterday. I'll just show you the build plate for that. I don't know if you if you saw it on stream, but the. Um, Just load up Lighty, you'll see it. Like this is the, this is the build plate of the X1 that you'll be showing, I think. And the X1 is um, the X1's a much, well, I say it's a much more, it's a slightly smaller build plate, like a five and a half inch, um, which is pretty much the smallest you're gonna you're gonna get on most of these printers. And yet, as you see, the um, the Troger fits in there perfectly. You probably get two of them on there <coughs> at a squeeze, and he's an 80 millimeter tall miniature. You know, he's a bit of a hefty unit, so you've still got room to get a load of extra things in around there. <coughs> in fact, when I when I geared up the print for him, I put the Cambion on there with um, I think it was a bunch of quasits and some. Some human troops as well. So I managed to fill the build plate and got about another half dozen minis on there, on top of the the big guy. So <clears throat> you know you can do you can do eight to ten models quite comfortably on on one of these smaller the, the smaller size of printer, the uh, five point five inch. And when you upgrade that to a Sonic Mini four K, which has got the six inch build plate, you see it's just got a little bit more real estate to work with. So you can get like, you know, comfortably get two of these on there plus a couple of other stuff. So if I, if I duplicate that one, you see I can put I can put two there, and then I've got room up here and here and all across the back and in the middle here to to kind of do stuff. Because I will, <clears throat> I don't know if I don't know if other people do this or if people tend to try and print just in the middle, but I will literally load every square millimeter of this build plate with as much stuff as I can. And when I've got all like little little tiny gaps, I tend to throw like rats in there and things like that. So I've got even the, the tinier gaps are going to get filled with stuff. And it doesn't even it doesn't even like add that much um, to the cost of the, the the model. So yeah, it's all uh, it's all good. And I say the the Ifrit model, which is you know how big that is, and the the, the female barbarian, the, the large scale one. They all go on on the uh, X1 no problem, so you don't really need to worry too much about the size unless you were gonna go like real overscale and do huge, great, big, massive things. <clears throat> but I saw um, I saw Ross at Fohammer, uh, his latest video, 
and he was kind of saying that the more the more he 3D prints the bigger stuff he wants to print so he's he's looking at like the bigger printers and stuff now um, and starting to get into those kind of the large scale stuff um, but like I say it's, it's all down to personal preference isn't it at the end of the day that lot so well, I'm not sure what pose we're going to do this guy and I don't know if we should put him in a shooty pose or if he should be I think I might use a pose I've used for my uh, Kingsguard for the Kingsguard Rifleman I'm going to go something like that <coughs> so uh, right, his gloves his boots uh, right his boots then An extra there. Well, that's a bit silly, isn't it? Right, so as usual, delete the internal geometry. Delete hidden, close holes. I'm dealing with a solid model. Okay, uh, this guy has got quite pointy shoes. So let's just pull the tips of his toes to a point. This guy, I feel, he's got that kind of, uh, you know, the Cavaliers and the the Musketeers kind of look. He's got that, he's got that kind of vibe, hasn't he? I think. That's what comes through to me, at least. So. Remove some of the obvious bits of an, like anatomy um, from the clothing here that you're not going to see through. The clothes aren't skin tight, so we don't want to see like calf muscles and stuff in the boots, for example. So I'm just smoothing them out, ankle bones and things like that. Now I, I always sculpt the clothing on a separate layer with the original body visible underneath, just to make sure we don't accidentally like carve into where the the body is. Although sometimes the uh, <coughs> you need to make the ankles a little bit thinner or the wrists a bit bigger or something like that and if you need to do that then the only way you're really going to do it is by by carving in and then you just have to just adjust the body underneath a little bit afterwards. Get the silhouette you want first on the actual armour or clothing and all that kind of stuff and then deal with the This looks shocking at the moment, but I promise you it will come together. Right, so what I want to do here is I just want to make sure the top of these boots has got a little bit of a bit of a rounder shape. Mate, it absolutely is. <coughs> so the uh, like three D printing, there's, su there's such a lot to kind of learn about it. Um, if you've got a, a full-on hobby commitment, it's actually quite a big ask for you to kind of then start learning to 3D print. Um, and especially if you go for FDM, I understand FDM to be a lot more fiddly. Um, and a lot of the, the cheaper FDM printers, you have to be prepared to like tinker with them a little bit. Um, now I'm not saying that's entirely true of all of them. I've seen like the, the, the new Elegoo Neptune... So I'm not a big fan of Elegoo resin printers, as I've said a few times. I don't like the ball, uh, the ball jointed build plate. If they could sack the build plate off, I'd, I'd give them a go. I think, but um, the Elegoo Neptune, which is a uh, an FDM printer, I've seen a couple of people showcasing that now, things that they've done on it, and like it literally seems to straight out of the box work. Um, and the print quality looks really, really good on it as well. Now, <clears throat> you can still obviously see 
the layer lines on it because if you look at the resin models that, that, that I print you won't find layer lines on them because they're I use anti-aliasing on the print we've got a 25 micron um, Z resolution Hang on a second let me just check the, the door because I'm waiting for a delivery we just mute the mic a sec so I can just speak to the delivery guy I don't think Hayley was in, but she's uh, she's here. She's got it herself. <laughs> <coughs> Looks like it's a, a package from Amazon, but we've had we've had a few issues with Amazon lately. Um, she's ordered like four or five different things that have either claimed they've been delivered and they're not, um, or they've um, what do you call it? They've they've just lost the parcels and they they were out for delivery and then they just never arrived and they've never been up updated to say they've been delivered and then we've had a message from them saying oh we think we've probably lost your parcel now um, you know if it is lost we'll refund you but you know that's not a you know it's not what you expect from a next day delivery service is it if you can't guarantee next day delivery don't guarantee it but <coughs> that's just me ranting about it I suppose but Yeah, and a, a squig speaker box. What like, what like a squig to put a speaker in to play your music out of? Sounds interesting. Well, I'm gonna guess that this is a little detail that is. It's just a detail on the boot rather than a separate layer, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna separate the boots from the uh, from this bit. Let's just polish it in. I can get in and detail it as such. <laughs> ah, right, right, got ya. Oh, good idea. Key if you if you're doing what I'm doing here is to try and keep it smooth and keep the flow nice. Um, usually, what I'll do is I'll come in with the little a little bit of a um, H polish like I'm doing now and just clean up the tops and the bottoms of the shape. <coughs> and then once the uh, the top and the bottom are cleaned up and, and trimmed up, uh, we can get in with the. Do you know what, actually? I'm not going to do with this. I'm going to uh, slice the foot off here and here. So if I put the poly groups on, you'll see this. So you'll see we've got three colours. I've stuffed this up already because I need to uh, make sure that is unmasked and just group group that top bit together. So I've got three I've got three colour layers here now. Each one of them is its own piece. Uh, I'm just gonna group and polish. Okay and what that's done now for me is it's separated this set centre piece. Oh, cheers bunker. Legend matey. I'm gonna bring the boot up I'm going to bring the leg down. I'm not going to merge them together because they're going to be. Uh, what do you call it? I want the, uh, the ankle to be poseable. Uh, but what I'm going to. What I'm going to do, I'm going to take this piece, I'm just going to polish it to shape. 
so it's completely flat and that way I can have a nice sharp top to the uh, to this piece should have just done this in the first place it would probably be easier but again it's like I say there's so many different ways you can approach something there's no right or wrong way it's what is going to work for you unfortunately what I started doing wasn't working how I wanted it to so you have to just change tact halfway through but like I say it's not the end of the world as long as you can recover from it if you ever do make a crap decision it's best to realise that as soon as possible and don't try and just push on with it just because through bloody mindedness realise it's crap as early as you can and uh, accept that and then move on to an improving uh, idea you can waste a lot of time chasing a bad idea if you're not uh, if you're not careful. Okay, so uh, it's nearly there. Nearly there. Let's let's just put it back in. Um, mask off these bits. Just do a little bit of pushing and pulling to get it to shape. Now that needs to come to a point at the moment, part there. So. Just lift this and lift this. And then the back can come down a little bit. So I want to make sure that the, the distance from the the leg to the uh, the trim, the outside edge of the trim is consistent all the way around. thinking as well, I don't know what you think of this bunker, but next week I'm going to do, or possibly do, as part of this month's release, uh, a little bit of a scenery bundle. We'll do some Mordheim-esque terrain with some um, some like ruins and little gangplanks and bridges and platforms and things. Fancy doing something a little bit different. Right, let's uh, let's add some resolution here. I'm going to no, not mask loss, so I'm going to mask rectangle. I'm just going to extract that. Not at that thickness there. It's like mad moon boots. <clears throat> yeah, I want to get I want to get into doing some more gaming with my little one. Um, and I was looking at like the Lord of the Rings sets and like the scenery I, I had from the original Lord of the Rings uh, game. <clears throat> and I'd quite like to do, you know, something similar. But also, I mean, I've done I've done a lot of scenery in the past for like the the Baron's War, all the uh, castles and fortresses and stuff, um, and I I love all that stuff. I love doing it, but obviously, I've done it for other people. I've never done it for myself. So yeah, I'm, I'm doing a little Mordheim esque set will be something that I'll be able to use with my nipper, get him into doing some uh, some skirmish games. 
And also, when we release Crystal Collapse, it could be used good as a, uh, as a, you know, a, a, an obstruction piece and things like that. So they'll they'll shoot into the games. But the doors going again. Is this this time? This might be my order from Sarissa actually. Yeah, it is. I can see the uh, I can see the P on the box. I was about to order some new bases from Sarissa because the uh, the products I've been sending out the they're all on um, 25 millimeter MDF bases, and with some of the stuff I've sculpted lately, like the ogres and um, the Cambia, and then some of the other larger models, they need a base that's a little bit bigger. Uh, the the Hellhounds as well, so the Hellhounds need a 32 mil base uh, to fit them on properly. So I've ordered some 32 mils, I've ordered a few 40 mils, so we've got something for the ogres to go on. Uh, but I've also ordered a load of 10 mil bases for all those little imps in the camp, uh, imps in the closets, because they just look lost when you put them on a 32 mil base. They look ridiculous. Um, so unless you've got to hoard them all up and do loads of them together, uh, I, I just feel like they need a smaller base. So I think a 10 mil should be about perfect for them. To be fair, so they should be arriving today. Got a few hundred of them rocking up, so I say today they should be in the package that the wife just picked up off the postman. But if you've not used the uh, the, the Sarissa bases and stuff, I'd recommend giving them a check because they're really reasonably priced. Um, if you go for the three mil ones, the thickness of them is pretty much about on par with the the GW standard bases. Um, so any any GW base. Um, can be subbed out for a, a Sarissa one if you buy the three mil thickness, and they, they're doing three mil thick and two mil thick, and it's actually not any different to um, in, in terms of the price to to choose them. It's just a it's literally just a choice. It doesn't affect how much you pay for it. So it's all good stuff. Right, give me a second, guys. I'm about to put the heater on to warm the office up to get some prints going. I know it's feeling a bit too warm. Yeah, it is. <laughs> right, let me just press print on my uh just gonna retry the Troga print now. Get that one on test. As it failed me this morning. So let's just delete the internal on that again, close holes. Um, I want to inflate that all up a touch so I can just shape it and polish it, not groups, just standard. Keep the resolution low so it's easy to work with. Yeah, and always makes your uh, appointment time in it. Somebody's coming around for you. I'll be around for a few hours anyway, mate, if you're uh, able to come and back. But otherwise, have a good day. I'll catch you in a bit. So I'm going to take the. Uh, flatten the boots sides. We just auto group this, so I've got one colour, so it's be easy for me to see. Top off. Oops, um, just bump the dyno mesh up on this one now. Okay, now with the uh, where are you mouse cursor? Right, there we go. I'm going to get my widget. Position the widget at the top. Roll it around so I've got a uh, an arrow pointing downwards. I was going to stretch. Up, stretch it to give it some height. 
from a decent bit of height here. Because the next thing I'm going to do is slice that off again. So I'm going to go. Hang on. Let's position that to the front a second. I'm just going to roll it back. It's got a bit of height to it there at the back. Not worried what the other foot's doing, by the way. Um, okay, a slice curve here. So what I've just got done will give it a slight bit of a heel at the back. the thickness of that again now so it's about where I want it that looks fine to me um, just need to bring the toe forward a touch there we go okay so I think we're in a good position there that's this message I've got Oh, just the raw mail. So I'm going to duplicate and mirror, uh, duplicate and weld that so it's the same on both sides of the shoot. Merge down. That says so the shoe's sole is now an integral part of the boot. Uh, the green, oops, let's just do that. The green part of the top, let's mask it. Uh, I want to add the creases into the boot here. So small draws, uh, small intensity, about 12, around about 50 on the on this, and with Z intensity, uh, Z intensity, with lazy mouse turned on. I can just do a few little large sized folds and creases so these aren't like this is basically where it's just something's just been pushed down like you'd have on the bottom of your trouser legs so if you're wearing like a baggy pair of jeans so once I've done the the large strokes like this I need to just go through and just add a couple of inverted ones. Only very gently, only very slightly. Okay, now right at the very top of this boot, we've got a little V shape. Oh, that can a little v-shape so let's just carve that out and then we've got a little overlap on the uh, on the boot itself on the trim at the top
we've got a little trim around the top of the boot which is similar in thickness to the one around the bottom of the boot so I'm just going to mask this and we're going to uh, extract it in a second Some grazing off. So, for some reason, if you've got gradient turned on on the colouring, for some reason, when you then try to paint a mask, the mask goes all weird. Um, and like streaky, like like it's marbled. I understand why you'd want a gradient when you're painting, but gradient masking is just weird. Just get this one all merged together now. Auto group it, and then I'll just go through and we can just clean up the edges. Okay, boots are done. Um so next to do is the coat, I think.
Okay, so the coat, it looks like we've got... Um, let's call them tails from the waist down. <coughs> we've got a couple of tails um, at the front. And then I'm going to say there's two at the back again. So two, two to the front uh, and two on the back sides of the coat. Top will... Let's just use the blue body here. Touch. Use the um, we'll just split it off. I, think. <coughs> I was going to try and keep it with the rest of them, but I'm going to have to split it. So I'm going to do a mask all around the bottom, and then I'm just going to cut the mask here, here, and here. And underneath, I'm just going to do the same again. Just going to make sure the mask is coming all the way through. Now I can do this and I want to be just above the knee, so that kind of height. going on at the front here. Again, okay, so it's still being pulled down in the middle somewhere. Somebody who was picking up a bit of geometry, it might have been internal geometry that I'd got masked uh, from earlier that was not, um, let's call it, not, not properly isolated or whatever. But <coughs> okay, so this morning, Elston, hey, they're here finally. Good news. Do you love them painted this afternoon, yeah? Finished off all of them. <laughs> so the way you paint would not surprise me. Anybody here is not familiar with Elston, uh, go onto YouTube, do a little search for Elston Asian. Elston, if you want to pop your YouTube link in, feel free, mate. And uh, check him out for some uh, fantastic hobby content. Like a, it's like watching a schizophrenic imp paint sometimes. 
in the nicest possible way, of course, Austin. He's done a few of my, uh, good few of my models over the years, and uh, he's just received his Ifrit models, so expect some uh, views of that soon. <laughs> I was waiting for a response, and I thought I've offended him. <laughs> So the neck of this which is going to slice off just there and do the group thing get rid of that so it's going to polish up the anatomy parts of this torso try and like smooth everything out To today, and also you, uh, you want to paint your day, or you uh, working? <clears throat> Good man, there you go. Follow that link. Check out Mr. Elston's content. Got some good little hobby tips and a, uh, a little bit of a chuckle on the way. Working the bane of our lives, though. Not mine. I love my work. The only bits of my work I don't like are the uh, having to do accounts and things like that. I've had a few people message me as well saying that the um, the link for the Cedric Dark Knight model that you get when you subscribe to my newsletter basically saying that that's dead. Um, so I need to sort out getting those guys a copy of the model sent over. And basically fix the link. It's just one of those little headache jobs, you know. You're just like, oh god, I know I've got to do it, but yeah, it should, man. <coughs> Definitely should. I've just put my uh, mentoring tier on the Patreon as well this month. It's a little bit of one, little bit of one-to-one -one mentoring. So if anybody wants a uh, wants a bit of that, ask any questions, get some coaching, feedback, critique on your work, uh, in a one-to-one -one and directed fashion, then absolutely sign up. I've only put three of them on there at the moment, we'll see how that one goes, if it works out well I'm going to open up more, but I'm also thinking about doing a more, like a less personalised one, but there's a, a prospectus I've written for sculpting the way I do, so running through like orientation, terminology, uh, orientation of ZBrush, um, and then going into various different brushes and how they're used. Um, some of the techniques of things. And then obviously the principles of sculpting miniatures and you know the things you need to know to distinguish yourself from making miniatures to making models. Or oh, sorry, from making models into making miniatures. Uh, things to account for in resin casting and or oh, sorry when designing sculpts for resin casting or metal casting um, so hopefully if anybody's interested in that kind of thing I can start running those and um, <coughs> we'll get some get some like public courses like scheduled in not quite sure the best way of doing that yet whether I should pre-record it and sell it as a course or run it as a live course. 
But I know obviously doing it as a live course is going to limit the attendance for some people, isn't it? But I'd like to do it properly with like assignments and things so we can kind of set you to task so you've got uh, an objective to go away and you know a little bit of a homework project you can work on and bring back in kind of thing and you know I can mark it, assess it, grade it, give you some feedback and all that kind of good stuff. So So is it sculpting you're thinking of learning, is it Elston, or are you thinking of doing a bit of uh, just learning a new skill generally? So just need to make sure the corners are sharp and that the edges are straight. <laughs> well, you know, we all get there at some point, don't we? I think I'd have, I'd have ended up where I was at some, where I am now, at some point in the, down the line. I'm fortunate that um, I had my hand forced by having to the uh, having to make a decision between the progress that I'd built up on the uh, STL file sales when I first started doing it. And um, what do we call it now? It's like I, when I first started, I was releasing back files. I should, I'm sure you're well aware, Austin. But I was releasing the uh, the stuff that I sculpted in my 2016 Kickstarter. <clears throat> so um, all of those files have been released as resin models. They've never been released as STL files. So I batched them down into groups, split them up, and released them over four or five months, or planned to release them over four or five months. And then, kind of, it was August 2019, they went live. So, uh, August, September, October, everything was going brilliantly, month on month growth. And the money I was getting every month then was actually uh, getting to a point where it was more than what I was earning in my day job. And what would have happened is I was sculpting like one new model a month or something like that at that point so I was I was adding an extra miniature to the already established set and then I got to that point where I'd made um, I'd made so many models I'd released them and I'd got a few more months lined up ready to go but the the models I got lined up were only going to take me to February <clears throat> and then come February I'd need to be making new content all the time it, it needed to be entirely new content and at the current rate I was sculpting, I was only able to put out like one to two models a month. So, <clears throat> essentially, from that point onwards, the October time, having assessed the uh, 
the potential future impact, um, I had to make a decision to either allow it to fall and hope people would accept two models a month, <coughs> or commit to it full time. And I was in a good position where I was earning more money doing that than my day job, so it was I could afford to do it then. I mean, if I was in the same position now, um, I'd say the money's probably it's now not as good as the as the day job, so I'd I'd probably have to run it as a sideline. <clears throat> but because I'm committed to it full time, it's uh, you know. It's got to be done, but again, quality of life is just—it's worth so much as well. And like being able to be here for the kids, um, having the flexibility to to do stuff when I need to do it—it's a—it's a good trade-off. Do you know what I mean? The money might not be quite as good as I would have been earning if I was, you know, sticking with facilities management and health and safety management, but <clears throat> I'm working on that, so. That's why I need you lovely people to go and visit my uh, my web store and go and buy some buy some models. <laughs> but for you, Elston, I would say I would say your YouTube channel channel is quite well established, isn't it? So. should be able to kind of jump back onto that, build more onto the YouTube channel. <coughs> and I say while I'm building my stuff, if you wanna if you wanna do blogs on mine and we'll link back to your um if you've got any like blog content you wanna write, you can publish that onto my website um if you want and we can get some links back to your uh your YouTube channels, get you some sponsorships going and stuff like that as well. So let's go put the, uh, the trim on. Yes, yeah, so, uh, as far as as far as the pressure to output. Um, that's one of the things I'm trying to work on at the moment. So I'm obviously still committed to doing the Patreon, um, and there is a there is an output expectation with that. The problem is obviously when new people join, they're expecting it to work like other Patreons that they've seen. Even though all the explanations there, it tells them how it's happening. Um, I don't think everybody fully reads that. So I don't want anyone to join and be disappointed because they're not getting models immediately. You know what I mean? So, if you join on any given month, you will get that month's content, uh, but it won't be there immediately because it's being sculpted during the month. So there's there's obviously there's a little bit of a uh, managing expectations that I've got to kind of get on top of and try and establish with, with new customers. Um, But the plan is, I'd like to be doing more, <coughs> more of this streaming, working in a more educational way. I think, um, working kind of inform people and educate other people to, you know, the ways of sculpting minis and whatnot. Um, and then obviously, use all of that to basically drive traffic to the to the web store. And get some uh, get sales through that. Um, but then on the side of all of these, we've got the games going on. So we've got the Crystal Collapse. Then we've got uh, the Adventurers Guild of Adelian, which I don't really know what that game's going to be called yet. So. So previously it was always just called the Adventurers Guild, but I 
So I, I still don't get it though, because some of the people who do like YouTube videos, <clears throat> they've got some massive followings and stuff, but they don't seem to have. Like the content isn't necessarily incredible. Do you know what I mean? Like the the things that they make are okay, or the painting quality is okay, or whatever else. And it's um, there's clearly something that draws people to to watch them. And it's, it's, it's that, you know, it's that, what, what do we call it? I don't know, the X factor of them or whatever. You know what I mean, whatever it is, you need to try and like, figure out what that is and find your own version, essentially. <clears throat> but I think you've got it, mate. I think you, I think you need to just, um, just do it now. Have you seen, um, I'm opening a can of worms here now, I, I know I am, but my uh, my kids love watching uh, a YouTube channel, which is for kids, so I don't think you would necessarily have seen it else, it's called Slick Slime Sam. <coughs> um, honestly, the older content is better than the newer content, the newer content is just like that, that kind of overly enthusiastic artificial American um, kind of like really annoying voice that doesn't stop for breath you know like there's, there's no such thing they're not allowed to have a pause in the video like a, 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 a second or two of silence is, is frowned upon so they have to cram noises and speaking into every single section and then you get all those Awful stock sounds that you hear. And every time I hear it, it makes my it makes me wince. You know that kind of. I can't even think what the noises are now. But like, I love Willow sitting in the corner of my office over here, um, and she's like watching YouTube. And and I, I always know when she's watching the crap with programs because I, I can hear all these kind of like the sound effects that they all use. That they're all like they're all proper stock sound effects, but they're. They're like the, the, the ones that every kid's channel will use. They're terrible. But Slick Slime Sam, there's a there's a girl called um, Susie who is the or Sue who's the um, like the main person. And her earlier videos, like now she does loads of like she does like the uh, blind bag openings and things like that. And they're just nonsense. Them ones are. I hate those videos. But early doors, she was doing lots of like cardboard crafting, which was quite interesting, and Lego builds. Um, and she had this character of Sam who was basically a slime um, and I'm not even going to describe what he looks like but it is literally just a solid model of a, a glob of slime um, it does look like something you would buy in an Ann Summer shop um, and it's got like googly eyes and a pair of glasses on and she does like a high pitched voiceover for him but Check, check, check them out on YouTube. She's got a massive, massive, massive channel subscription, um, what following numbers. Uh, and she's been going for for quite a while, but um, you only ever see like her hands when she's doing the uh, doing stuff. And then Sam's kind of like her co-presenter. It's obviously it's her putting on a silly voice with a kind of a, a synthesizer to change the voice up or whatever, or I assume that to be the case. <clears throat> but. Um, like with you, where you've got this like this monologue going, and you've got like your little your narrator person like telling you off. Um, I can kind of imagine you with a little slick slime Sam kind of apprentice of your own, trying to teach him how to paint models or batch paint and stuff like that. And just, I, I imagine you could make something quite amusing with that kind of like puppetry prop type thing. Yeah, I like your narrator. <laughs> I love the way you berate you. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome, mate. I say it's one of those kind of things, though, where you know you've got like a younger audience that you want to kind of 
you want to introduce to the hobby as well. I mean, obviously, you'd have to tone your language down for that one if, if you're going down that route. But if you if you're going to like aim for a younger audience, um, and let's face it, kids will watch anything. He is, but he's in a lovable way, mate. Kids will watch any anything online, especially if he's got like silly puppets and sound effects and things like that. So, you know, I mean. They, they watch a lot of like crafty videos so if you're teaching them how to make stuff and you can generate it for kids you know mini miniatures for kids is potentially an untapped market isn't it everybody's aiming the uh, videos at, at grown ups and uh, and hobbyists but I mean, when I was a kid, and I wanted, I wanted like to feed my Warhammer addiction. It was my mum and dad I'd go to, and it was like Christmases and birthdays and things like that. And it was, you know, they'd they'd go out and get us like big wedges of models and stuff. And uh, you just know there's going to be an awful lot of parents out there. It will be cursing your name for introducing their child to Warhammer. Belt here, so I'm not going to put anything in this section. And then we'll go here again. I, I kind of don't, I don't really expect you're going to see this. I don't know why I'm spending so much time doing it, but So Elston, just for the just for the other boys and girls watching, would you like to give us a, a quick a quick rundown on the quality of the Ifrit prints and what you received? Just worry if you get a glowing reference now or it completely backfires and he's got holes to pick. <laughs> Although I quality I quality checked that whole prop that whole order myself, so I know full well it was a good one. That's why I can ask in confidence. Well, with confidence rather not in confidence. We're on a live stream, there's no inconfidence here, is there? There you go, quality is outstanding. So just if um, so, what are people going to have to do to win the for it then, Elston? Is it going to be part of your video, or uh, is it like a like and subscribe and share thing, or what's your plan? So El Elston's got two of these, and he's going to be giving one of them away. Um, <coughs> give me a second; I will find the actual item that you talk we're talking about. So. If it, where are you? Here's my here's my digitally painted version of him. So, Elston, if you need a colour reference, or if you want to use that as a uh, as a lookup, so that is what uh, these are the colour scheme I've gone for on on my painted version. <clears throat> so, basically, if if you're not familiar, um, is a character that's appeared in most Final Fantasy games that have ever been released, but he's also come up in other things. I think there's some historical founding for him. I believe he's some kind of like fire genie or something like that in some uh, Middle Eastern um, mythologies. But yeah, basically he's a he's a big demon who varies between like a beast form, like I've done here, or like a more human-looking character, usually with some big horns uh, and. Almost always summons some kind of like big flaming fiery attack on the uh, on the enemies. Oh, 
do I extract this or do I just inflate it? Let's try and extract first. Let's thin that extract right down. That works pretty well. Let's try to delete that and close holes. See if that works or is this going to be a fail? Hey Bunky, you're back. <laughs> he is, he's an epic he's an epic summon. Oh, yeah, that did not work. Let's uh let's undo that one then. I'm just going to bring the, the thing up here. I just want to extract, extract this back so that it's got. Let's just let's try and correct the height on it. I want this to be going straight backwards. Let's get the resolution pumped up, let's polish this. And get into cleaning up the edges of the internal extractions. But actually, to be fair, they're pretty clean on this one. It's just there, I think. I suppose my next question uh, in relation to the, the summons and stuff is if I'm doing another summon does anyone have a preference as what they'd like to see for the, uh, for the next one to be? I was thinking uh, we've got Odin, we've got uh, Shiva. I mean, part of me kind of thinks Shiva, Titan, um, was it Ramu? Was the lightning guy, wasn't he? Maybe stick with the lightning guys, uh, the lightning guys, the, the, the basic elemental ones before moving on to like the the ones that are a little bit more bespoke, like carbuncle and all that kind of stuff. moving all this out and getting it flattened down so it can be positioned and posed. It may not actually show through anyway but um,
to try that now. Let's just. Wow. It's like a fingerprint, isn't it? Yeah, she was a, she was a good one. I like Shiva. I wasn't keen on the weird motorbike version they did in Final Fantasy Thirteen, but I think Final Fantasy Thirteen was a massive miss on a lot of things, wasn't it? It wasn't like if you were going to introduce somebody to Final Fantasy as a as, as a thing, like Thirteen wouldn't be the go-to, would it? I mean, I still, I still haven't played the um, Final Fantasy VII Remake, actually. I'm kind of a bit disappointed with what I've gathered they've done with it, so... Like, they haven't just remade it, have they? They've, they've, sorry, they haven't, they haven't just... Um, like, redone it. They've, like, reimagined the whole thing as well. <coughs> I saw I saw a whole section that uh, somebody was like yesterday afternoon I was on a uh, on Twitch and I was watching it uh, I can't remember the gaming channel now gaming channel popped up and it was um, somebody playing the game and it was the they were in uh, is it was it Don Corneo um, when you're in Midgar and you have to go and when Cloud has to dress as a girl and go and sneak into the mansion, and uh, I didn't see I didn't see any of like the dressing as a girl and sneaking around bit, but I saw like a bit of Corneo's mansion, and there was like a whole character in there that I've I'd never seen before. I didn't know who he was. Some guy in a baseball cap, um, and like they were all talking to it. Everything just seemed like I don't know, it just seems to have lost the charm of the original. Like all the stuff I loved about the, I mean, yeah, the graphics are better, but everything I loved about that original one seems to not be there. Yeah, I, 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 again, I didn't see any. I didn't hang around long enough to see any combat in there, but I imagine they've probably followed suit with some of the some of the later uh, the later games. Now, I like I like the Final Fantasy Online game. I do like the way they've done it on there. Um, so. You know the way they've done. Um, what do you call it now? <clears throat> they've done um, the combat in such a way that you, you're still running around uh, the world map, but you can see all of the uh, enemies. I do like that that mechanic, and then obviously you run in and you have to you have to fight them. But that's done in an MMO for, uh, format, so it doesn't actually follow the standard. Games where uh, games where it doesn't follow the standard Final Fantasy kind of fighting systems. No, I, d I don't think it is. I think things were things were different, weren't they? Because the engines were different. Um, and I think when they say when they say they're doing a remake of the game, I mean, yeah, you know, there's a, there's an element of old school in there, isn't there? But. Somebody tells you they're doing a remake, um, and they show you all these swanky new graphics. Considering how good the original game actually was in terms of its storyline, the side quests, the sub games, all the hidden secrets, all that kind of stuff, I'd just like to see that whole thing getting like a facelift, really. And so unfortunately it's not what we get, is it? We get some kind of like complete reworking of the original that takes it like, you know to another another level but not necessarily a better one.
Right. So that's merged up with the coat itself. Okay. So we've got coat, we've got trousers. Uh, well, we've got trousers, we've got part of the trousers. Let's give him a belt. Nice and easy. Well, so his belt's quite thick. Um, and what we got? Laser my on, turn the intensity down, turn the size up again. brush here now I've got the uh, layers and stuff on here but what I can do is I can just draw straight over all of this oh. and if I hadn't masked it it would work perfectly I want nothing masked I'm going to just draw over the lot in fact let me just somebody else at the front door now who's this We ordered. Postman just rocked up with this like enormous, great big box. I've got no clue what it is. I'm talking bed. I'm talking like uh, talking big. It looks like you know we have a bed delivered, and it's like a it's that big. Piece of furniture kind of size. <clears throat> okay, so close it on. Right, belt is on. Right now he's got this belt, and then he's got another belt coming from. Do you want to duplicate that? So this is where it's it's good working from an illustration, but it would be lovely to have like actual details of these parts. So we'll look at the belt. We've got the belt going across here, and then we've got this like 
slung bit with the strings on, the little ropes. And then we've got the a bit coming off the side here. And then like a little harness clip. A little, what's it called, like a little belt constrainer or something like that. I don't know what you call it, but we've got all of these little bits working away here. And I don't know what any of them are. Because the gun's in the way, I'm not really sure what to make of them. <coughs> Let's go on to the earlier sketches and see if we've got any um, <coughs> anything visible there. I've got one with a little bit more detail, thankfully. The previous version of the gun on. Um, Mr. Powder, I'm looking for the original artworks. something guys just need it to make sense of this um this bit I'm looking at It's not even on there. <laughs> Damn it. I thought it was on the original. <coughs> the belt would come over from the original artwork, but it's not there. God, that's annoying. Okay, let's grab the. Just fine though. So there we go. So if you look at this one, you can see I've got a little bit more of what's going on here, but still not really enough of what's going on up here. I'll just have to work with it. In fact, no, I'm telling a lie, it's exactly the same as it was. <coughs> it's just in line art format. So it still shows me nothing really. Um, So 
This belt is thinner than this one. This is the thicker belt. Um, right. I'm going to go and quickly grab another cuppa and a snack. Because I'm still drumbling. So, um, let me put you on a BRB. While I am on a BRB, if you care to uh, visit the web store and go and have a little shoppy shop, you can uh, go and buy some swag. And cheer yourself up for the day. And me too. <laughs> well, the seriousness, guys, I'll be back in uh, just a, a couple of minutes, alright? Catch you in a minute.
Oh guys, we're back. Um, <coughs> so it turns out that massive box that arrived, which I was wondering what it was, thinking it was a bit of furniture, actually a Christmas tree. So <laughs> um, we've been buying a, a real Christmas tree for years now, and then this year we bought one. Um, thought it was well, we needed something that was a little bit more slimline. So we bought this uh, this tree, um, and it turned out to be bigger than any tree we've ever had in the past. It's about three meters wide at the base. <laughs> it needed a massive hack down to actually make it fit. Um, Haley wasn't very impressed with the whole episode, so uh, we agreed we'd go back to rather than spending sixty quid on a Christmas tree every single year, go back to getting a good. Good quality artificial one. <coughs> that we can just pull out when we need to. <coughs> so yeah, that was our uh, furniture delivery in inverted commas. I also just saw uh, Chapter Master Valrock make a bit of a goof on his latest video. I was brewing up. So apparently they've got the uh, the new Dante model, Commander Dante's out. <clears throat> so I haven't touched Jet Games Workshop stuff for decades now. Um, specifically, not 40k. Uh, I have got um, Blackstone Fortress, which I'm working my way very very slowly through painting the models on. So once I've got everything painted, we'll have a, we'll have a couple of games of that, and we'll give that one a go. But the uh, <coughs> actual 40k game, I haven't really played that since. God, just after Black Te uh, no Black Templars were in it before, already, weren't they? When the Tau were first introduced, um, I had a small Tau army, and I used to collect them then. Um, <coughs> but. Yeah, it's been a long, long time since I've touched anything 40k. But when I did, I did use to collect Blood Angels. Um, uh, Mephisto was always my favourite, so. But why wouldn't he be? You know, he's a badass vampire lord, isn't he, in Space Marine Power Armor, so. What's not to love? <coughs> To figure out the connection to the body, no, sorry, to the rest of the belt. But yeah, he basically goes on to say uh, it's Commander Dante of the Dark Angels. So, <laughs> um, he did correct it later on, but he didn't. He didn't acknowledge the uh, the gaff at the beginning. Then. So I've got my Sarissa bases down here as well now, so that's ready for the uh, the orders going out, thankfully. So I've been ordering for, uh, amongst other things, some of the closets. So I'm very, very, very glad that my uh, 10 mil bases have arrived before I have to send the closets out. <laughs> God, I hope they're going to be big enough now. They might actually be too small. Might need to get um, a slightly bigger one. Oh, 
forward then. <clears throat> Robin about buckle. Just why not? Okay, I've put too much of a, a lean on that, I think, so that needs to come this way a touch. to slice it off here. It's about the right place, give or take. Duplicate it, mirror it, I'm going to thin it. And shrink it, and then it's going to come down and hang off there. Let's go for looking at the shapes he's used in the art. So we've got a rectangle with a maybe a circle circular rectangular clip, I don't know. I suppose at this point there's no wrong answer, it's just my interpretation of it. But I like to know functionally what things are doing, if that makes sense, when I'm sculpting bits. This shape kind of makes the most sense to me. So I'm going to lock that in. Um, 
<coughs> so I'm going to merge the shapes together. I'm going to polish it with a bit of resolution, 680 or thereabouts. Dynamesh it. Probably need a bit more resolution than that. 800. A bit of polish. There we go. And I'm going to. Uh, oh no, not knife. Knife. We don't do knife. Knife kills it. Knife kills it. I'm going to slice the front off. I'm going to slice the back off. I'm going to group it. I'm just going to select that bit in the middle. Delete everything else. Okay, there's my little belt clip thing I'm going to go with. Yeah, I, I tend not to. Um, I don't really do powder weapons an awful lot. But I know part of that... So part of it is because I've been sculpting stuff for the Descent into Avernus campaign, which so we can't, can't keep talking about for too much longer. <clears throat> so I've been sculpting stuff that is um, able to be used in there. So within that setting, it's just not propped up yet. So I haven't had to do a lot of them. And then right back at the beginning when I started doing um, doing my models and I did my original Kickstarter, there's a couple of models like the Rogues, for example, where I gave them flintlock pistols uh, or wheel lock pistols and um, Witch Hunter has got them and things like that. And people complained about it. They wanted... Um, there's a lot of people who play D&D &D who don't like black powder weapons in their games um, so yeah it's one of those it's one of those weird kind of things that is it's polarizing to people and you either have to do options or if I'm not doing options it's kind of easy to just avoid it <coughs> so that's, that's the only reason I haven't done it and I have considered sci-fi um, and in fact <coughs> we've got uh, got some plans for a nice a nice sci-fi game um, which should be quite an interesting one um, I don't know if you if you're familiar with uh, Moly um, Peter Coleman he's a, a, a DM um, professional DM he does a lot of um, kind of like gaming content and stuff uh, he, d he does run a, uh, a, a Twitch channel as well, but I don't think he does an awful lot on there at the moment. Uh, but he is, um, or he's offered to offered to assist and help compile this game, um, where we've we've basically got this like. So we're taking taking the kingdom of Talarius like into the future. So imagine like um, we literally jumped the timeline forward, you know, a couple of thousand years, um, and then we've got like we go from like a fantasy setting up into like a, a more sci-fi version of where we're at. So we've still got all of like the the mixture of different races all living together, 
you've still got the same like world environment and everything else. And the problem with the um, I don't know how much you like know about the the world of a Dillion I've created for the, um, the game, but basically the uh, the world is still essentially the same. They've got some new defenses and things in there, so it's like a, it's, it's evolved and moved on a little bit. Uh, and uh, the, the premise behind it is we're going to have um, all of the different races will have some unique skills and unique stat lines, but they'll basically just be, you know, a, a, an aesthetic choice more than anything else. Um, and then you'll choose like a class of, of character, so there'll be certain kind of like. Um, Certain kind of like preferences that classes will have, and then you'll tool them up a little bit like building a Necromunda gang. So you, you, you kind of tool your gang up, but you have to choose whether they're from uh, one of three different areas. So we've got um, we've got like different factions within the game anyway. But then you've got you've got like plate dwellers and you've got um, underworlders. So. If you've seen um, Battle Angel Alita, imagine that kind of setup. Or Midgar from Final Fantasy VII is a, a nice, easy reference. I know you, we're going to get um, the guys with the money have all moved up onto the plate at the top. So like the, the cities are going upwards. So everybody with the money lives up on the top, and all of the all of the poorer people, <coughs> the working class kind of ones, they all live down the bottom, um, and. You've got like security companies providing, uh, you know, security for, you know, your, your big companies up on the on the plate. So you'll have like, the big companies will be like your Amazon and um, what do you call it, like Netflix and uh, those kind of guys. So like they'll all be there, but they're all like mafia type organisations. And you'll have security companies who are like freelance uh, security providers, all kind of vying for, um, for space. Uh, and for, for territories and stuff and then we're going to add this I uh, can't remember what we called it now but like a notoriety type thing a bit like Grand Theft Auto when you go around and the more the more damage you cause and the more rules you break the more police come after you so during the game there'll be a kind of a, a, a like a I don't know how to describe it <clears throat> it's like a, a wanted rating and if your wanted rating goes up to a certain level, then the the, uh, like the, the police are going to turn up and try and like have you. So you can use that to your advantage and try and like or to try and deliberately push. Yeah, heat meter for lack. Yeah, that'll, that'll do. Your heat meter hits a certain level. Um, all of your police are going to descend onto the, uh, the, the the battlefield as well. Um, so you can either do that to do it on purpose to try and like you know pile into your opponents and uh, cause them some trouble or you can completely avoid it and avoid doing like naughty things publicly so that'll be things like weapons that make noise will obviously raise your heat meter I think explosions will raise it you know uh, getting caught doing hacks and things will raise your heat meter <coughs> so it'll be somewhere between I suppose it'll be it'll be somewhere between like Necromunda and Infinity in terms of the, the like the game kind of style, but it'll have it'll have my my kind of general aesthetic, but sci-fi'd up with like guns and stuff. <clears throat> and then we've got like up on the top plate, you've got health and safety regulations and stuff. So weapons are nice and reliable, but they're paired back to the safe thresholds. So you know like in 40k the a plasma gun will blow your arm off. So the plasma guns in this one uh, on the plate would be paired back to the point where they're actually safe to fire repeatedly without blowing your arm off. But that means they're not going to be as powerful. And then the, the ground dwellers or the underworlders who manage to get hold of surface tech, they can re-engineer it or reverse engineer it or modify it and hack it. Um, and they don't care about the health and safety aspects so they can just start um, turning the power up but obviously they are going to then risk blowing their arms and legs off so you'll choose whether you're going to be a you know a plate dweller or an underworlder <clears throat> an underworld faction or a plate dwelling faction 
um, or you know what kind of sub factions you're going to be within that, and then you have like s skills and uh, objectives and things like that, and uh, sorry skills and talents and uh, weapons and equipment. So th it'll be an interesting one, but obviously there's there's going to be a lot of a lot of work you have to go into that to make the models because like, I haven't got anything that pre-exists that we can just tap into. So early doors, we're going to go for. <clears throat> um, games that will use the existing model range that will give you a reason to to want to add certain models to it. I say me being me, that's probably going to be a Mordheim esque type type game. Um, but I may still add the heat meter uh, into it when you're in the um, certain scenarios. So, like for example, when we're in, um, if you're in like the capital city, we know there's going to be like a big guard presence there. So we could include the heat meter into that one, um, and still, still kind of have that same, um, you know, you're drawing too much attention to yourself kind of thing going on. Yeah, it'd be nice. It'd be nice to kind of see it all come, see it all come together. I don't know how long the sci-fi one's going to take to get there, but I say it's going to need some uh, some dedication to on my part to do the sculpting. I think because I could probably start by taking a lot of the uh, fantasy figures we've got and kind of advancing them in a the timeline. That'll probably be a good starting place. Or we do the modulus. We do a modular thing where we do like you know here's your. I've already got all the modular heads and stuff, haven't I, for the, uh, the Kingdom of Talaria stuff. So could just go right. Here is your. Um, what do we call it? <clears throat> here's your heavies. Here's your. Um, I don't know your hackers. Here's your your general kind of like gangers and whatever else different ranks and whatever make a dozen different bodies for each one and then just have a couple of dozen heads and then a load of weapon options for them so I don't know, maybe modular is the way to go with that cheers Bunker Would you like to see me do some sci-fi stuff with you? Turn Corrado off, can't I? Because I don't actually need him there now. Hey, Skyhawk, how you doing? <laughs> yeah, so so this guy, like I say, he's he is a magic user in the game. So we we're called in on breakers. Um, so he does have uh, this magic rifle. So let me just bring him down on screen so you can see him. A little bit closer up. So he does. He does have this like magic rifle that we're going to be uh, sculpting in, <clears throat> um, and essentially this thing is is building up charges of magic. So he, he he is not himself magically orientated. He doesn't use magic himself. Who's at the front door now? Hang on a second. Let me just mute you a sec, guys. I'm not to speak to at the door.
Well, we're on it today. We've got delivery after delivery after delivery. It's not just non-stop. Right then. Let's get back into this one. Yeah, so what I was saying then, so he's... His uh, his gun is like this. This chamber here is basically building up magical energy. So we've got like uh, a little crystal in there, which I can't remember where we said the crystal. I think this bit here, where the hand is, this bit is a crystal, um, which is basically where they like load they load it in. Um, so the crystal shards that the the game is like revolving around in terms of its story, the crystal shard is inserted into the weapon, and then the weapon amplifies the power of the crystal shard and then turns it into a a gun basically so it turns them into projectile bullets so he will stand there and he will he will literally like work like a magical sniper um, shooting your opponents but when he hits them rather than having to worry about where he hits them or what direction he's coming from because the game's very directional so if you've ever played Final Fantasy Tactics it's a similar kind of principle where you get your characters in the game and you have to position their facing and the facing of the character is important for the direction they're acting in but also for their um, their ongoing defence so it's always beneficial to kind of work your way around and attack a character from either the side or the back back being the, the most preferable <clears throat> so strategically that's how you're going to be doing it with this guy because he's using a magical projectile when he hits you, he hits you, it doesn't matter where he's hit you from. He doesn't get a benefit from hitting you to the back or the side, so he just hits you straight up. Because um, obviously if he if he shoots a fireball at you, you're on fire. It doesn't matter where you're on fire. <laughs> so you can't defend you can't defend against it better because you've turned around, you know, to face it. It just means you're getting shot in the face. So um <clears throat> That's the uh, that's the gist of this. We are actually we're not including black powder as such. We've got this Magitech kind of vibe going on. Oh, and I've just closed my bloody image down now. Let me get it back again. So I don't think I don't think the belt buckle I've put in is actually going to work. So I'm going to just take that off and just delete it. Um, let's do a few divisions on the belt. Now we've got some. So if you look over to the right hand side of the uh, the belt, I don't know if you can really see it very well, but we've got this. Uh, it almost like looks like the hanging bit here is like hooked over the belt in some way, like with like a loop attachment or something like that. So I think I might go with something akin to that. So if I take the take this piece that I've made already. What are you up to today, Skyhawk? Got anything nice on your on your builds going on? Let's just let's just drag this up a touch into there.
Right, I'm going to try, see if this works or not. You made, have you made them but they're a little bit too fine and a bit too uh, a bit too fiddly for the printer it's easy done A second. I think we we all do that at times, mate. It's just one of those uh, one of those things, isn't it? You just have to learn from your mistakes and kind of. I always find it's it's useful to have something as like a scale reference or as a, you know, something that you know is the minimum thickness you can get away with, um, and have that in the scene with you that is like correctly at scale. <clears throat> and then if you know that's the uh, that's the that's your kind of your cut off point, if you like, you know not to push it beyond that. I don't know if that might help you. feel like this this now needs the end just rounding off of touch <clears throat> so doesn't need it on the other one <clears throat> but on this this version it does Just put a crease in there so it facilitates the little loop better. There we go. <coughs> and it definitely does need a belt buckle. Ah, oh, no, here's a weird one. So that was a cube when it went in. You see how it's gone into a weird star shape? So when you focal shift, for some reason, every so often, it goes back up to zero where it should be minus 100. And this is when you're using the scale, rotate and movement tools. Um, and if you've got it, so that, an easy way of showing you is if I, if I if I make this this shape and I push the focal focal shift back to zero where it was so at zero at minus 100 I can move it left and right and it's fine if I put it back to zero when I move it you see it starts bending it's like I'm pulling it away from that center point <coughs> like the uh, 
the point I'm pulling from it's it's got less influence on the uh, the whole model and the problem is it's really easy when you're moving things around on a model when you're posing it particularly <coughs> to accidentally have that happen because it just happens randomly there's no there's no reason for it as far as I can tell it's just one of these weird little zebrush glitches that happens <coughs> so if you ever get odd stretching like that that's why that's bloody happened again got to turn it back I mean, you can use it for like a nice effect if the, if you know what you're doing and you can manipulate it. But there's other ways of achieving it as well. This needs that again. Save it because I haven't done it in a while. There we go, belt on. Ish. been deformed a little bit. I bet that's because of that, um, <coughs> what do you call it, that same uh, issue we've just, I've just demonstrated. I 
Let's just replace the ring altogether. Right, so we do have the uh, <sighs> Trying to decide what to do with this belt buckle now. I'm going to put um, symmetry on. On X and Y. Which will fail me. Still. So, I want to take <coughs> the uh, centre part of the belt and bring that up. But, I need to do it with the the mask softened. What's a Rosso bunker?
Right. <clears throat> so we've got a belt. Uh, we've got a bag to hang on the belt. So let's add the belt. Looks like a little book pouch this does, so it maybe is magical. Ah, soup. Polish soup. Chicken stock, carrots and fine pasta. Nice. When you say fine pasta, you're talking like is that like a bit like minestrone or like the like a like a noodle soup kind of thing? Like that kind of fine. Alright, so let's you uh, let's you hit it harder on the uh, booze in. Sounds like good stuff, Bunker. Oops. Raymond type pasta. <laughs> you have to cook the chicken for that long. Oh, it's only it's only three hours, isn't it? Do you put it in a slow cooker then, or do you uh, just like stick it on the hob and uh, and boil it? <clears throat> we got one of those uh, ninja ninja foodie like air fryer kind of multi-cooker things they're really good to be fair it's got the uh, it's got a pressure cooker um, setting on it so you can like you can use it as a pressure cooker and um, once you've done the pressure cooking stuff you can like crank it back down and put it on like a slow cook and I found like cooking uh, you know if you do like a lamb shank or a pork shoulder or something in there you can get the initial kind of quick cook with the pressure cooker so it's ready in like 40 minutes and it's like you can do pork pork in 40 minutes in there <coughs> so um, get it on a quick cook in the pressure cooker and then switch it onto the slow cooker mode and I found that's quite good for uh, a lot of things really
So the fat, the fat is the critical bit then. So it's not not for anyone doing like a New Year diet then. <coughs> yeah, we only got we only got the ninja because my mom my mom and dad bought it us for Christmas last year. Although to be fair, I will say we use it an awful lot. Um, I did think it was just going to be like a gimmick, if I'm honest. Uh, but it's turned out it's it actually gets an awful lot of use. So I can't really complain. <laughs> oh, good stuff. <clears throat> it's family, uh, family Polish then. Well, they're just fans of the food. Is that, is that your favourite Polish thing to, uh, to cook or have you got other, other dishes that are like your go-tos? Cooking wise, I, I cook tons of things I do but... I never really do anything that's like traditional, if that makes sense. It's like for dinner last night we had, uh, we had salmon fillets. Um, <clears throat> that were cooked in the air fryer actually. So air fried the salmon fillets. Um, we had some sautéed potatoes, add salt and uh, green chilli and onion tossed through. So that was really nice. Some uh, spinach with a bit of garlic butter wilted down. Poached egg. And uh, avocado, I think it was. It was all absolutely bloody delicious. If I do say so myself, of course. <coughs> I do love cooking. We talked years ago, before before the idea of doing this um, was even like a thing. Before we got kids, we were talking about opening like a little um, a little restaurant, doing like a British version of tapas. do something nice with that but <laughs> yeah we we do we do share the cooking occasionally but for, for the most part I, I cook I cook most of the meals we eat 
But that's because I enjoy cooking though, it's not because she doesn't want to do it, it's because I, I like doing it, so. You know those days where you've, you've got nothing in, you're like, you've run your, you've run your, uh, your fridge bare, and you've got to get shopping but you can't be bothered. On those days, I'm quite good at just cobbling up a meal out of nothing. Where she'll just stand there and look at it going, needs to go shopping. Needs to go shopping, got nothing in. Oh, nah, leave it to me, I'll sort something out. I'm on a thousand sixty four resolution here and it's still not anywhere near enough so I think I think this is gonna end up being one of those one of those sculpts where the uh, resolution has to be like ridiculous and high. There you are Elston. You just miss me making a bag. A man bag. A bag for a man. There we go. Pork and cabbage stew. Goonkey. Stuffed cabbage with pork mince. Sounds nice, that does. Is that a bit like a... Uh, is that a bit like Yuk Sung? But without like the Chinese spicy. Hmm. Oh, that's something I want to get into a bit more this year. Actually, it's like the uh, like the Asian cookery. I want to do more like Japanese things, Chinese. Because Jacob's really getting into all his uh, he loves all his like sushi and stuff. And I used to I used to make sushi at home. Um, I used to have all like the proper stuff for it, but. Yuk Sung is like, Yuk Sung, if you've never had it, it's, uh, a lot of Chinese uh, restaurants do it as a starter. And it's um, it's minced pork, and I think, I want to say water chestnuts, I think they mince pork and water chestnuts together. And it's cooked in um, like a, a light spice, a light Chinese spice and um, soy sauce. <coughs> and then they serve uh, crispy vermicelli noodles, like the rice noodles, like deep fries so they puff up and go crispy serve them with it and it's all stuffed into a lettuce leaf um, and like packaged up so you can you hold it as like a, a hand handheld like snack thing but they're really nice Making myself hungry, you know.
Yeah, these these, these tend to be the same, about the same. I mean, lettuce leaf, I'm talking like you know the uh, the iceberg lettuce, the, the big leaves you get around the outside. If you're not too frugal with the fillings, they're about fist size as well, actually. But they are, they are tasty. But I've never really, I've never really tried any any like Polish food or anything, so. We don't really have any, uh, like Ram Boyos, we don't really have any Polish restaurants or anything like that, so we've got nothing to like, base it on. It's in Solihull now, we've, we've just had, I mean, there's like a few Japanese restaurants are starting to appear, like near us. Um, so we're getting like more of the, <coughs> more of like the, uh, the East Asian kind of cuisines, like uh, I want to say there's a Korean one somewhere, but I'm not 100% certain. Um, but most of the stuff we've got is just like Euro European round here. Um, you know, your typical kind of like Italian. You know, the odd, odd Chinese restaurant. Lots and lots and lots of Indians, of course. Um, yeah, mostly just... This is just you running the mill stuff, really, I suppose. It'd certainly be nice to start seeing a little bit more. Um, what do you call it? Kind of variety in the type of food that's available. It always annoys me when you see the Just Eat app and there's all these different kind of like options on there. When you click it to filter it, there's nothing there. Some uh, creases in the bag. <laughs> yeah, that's the one. Well, it's not even that actually. Like, literally, we just don't even get the options on there because, like, if the restaurants don't deliver to the area, then they they just don't even appear. So, um, I'll say half half of the kind of you fancy something a little bit different. So you select some of the options that are available to you, and then all of a sudden, it's like you're looking at a blank screen. And there's just nothing at all. So. It's a terrible shine. I think people are starting to open up to it a little bit more, aren't they? It's like I know when you look at like my, my parents and my grandparents, like the, the thought of foreign food being British just you know, they just were not up for it at all. My mum and dad are fine with like, you know, curries and things, but we even tried to get them to have a tie once with us. Um a really nice Thai restaurant by one of our old houses that we lived in, and uh, I said to them like, you know, come come and try this. You know, they love they love an Indian, they love a Chinese. Come and try a Thai. It's like the perfect combination of both. You know, you've got all the curries and stuff, but they're they're like lighter, they're fresher. Nah, not interested. Didn't like it at all. <laughs> so, never even attempted to try and uh, convince them to try Japanese food or anything else it's just um just let them get on with what they like so and then the grandparents are just like you know they're just not fans at all they just want pie and chips every day you know pie and mash <coughs> Yeah, I think for I think for me, if I'm if I'm choosing a if I'm choosing a takeaway, it's gonna be 
it's going to be Thai or Japanese would be my absolute preference. But they are both on the pricey end of the spectrum, so. Right, this little strap here bothers me because there's nothing on it, so I'm going to put a couple of little pouches on. <laughs> did you ever see the uh, was it Carl Pilkington who did a broad bunker um, and he went off to China and they were eating like fertilised chicken eggs and um, like chicken feet and frog's legs and all that kind of stuff and he had to sit and join them <laughs> it was hugely entertaining it was I think that was my favourite one when you went to China. Did he fill his entire suitcase with like, Monster Munch or something so he had something to eat? Because he didn't trust the local food. So much of pot noodles. <laughs> I mean, he, was in, in, he went to India, didn't he? And that was when he, I think that was when he packed all the the monster munch. Remember him being in some kind of like real, like, you know, infested hovel of a hotel, and having a view of the Taj Mahal or something like that. There's going to be some gap filling going on here with these pouches and things once he's posed, but I'll do that after posing. So, legs. From the waist down, I think we're. Oh no, I'm almost done, sorry.
Hm. Again, I'm not really sure what's going on with this particular bit in the drawing. So I'll quick look and see how my Oh, my music is nearly running out, let's bring it back. Carl wasn't acting in a way most Brits wouldn't. That's why when you travel to countries that have high UK tourist rates, you get greasy spoons. Yeah, I yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, entirely my experience as well. So I've, I've gone out to Spain um, and Canary Islands and places like that looking for local restaurants. And all you can find is, like I say, your uh, Irish pubs, isn't it? Irish pubs everywhere. That's, that's all you ever find in Spain. It's really hard to find like actual proper local meals in touristy places, at least. I say presumably it's just because they know that it's not what people want to eat necessarily, which is a shame, really, because. I think everything would be a bit more interesting, wouldn't it, generally, if uh, everybody was a little bit more um, prepared to try something different.
was um, a friend of my mum and dad's actually. And when when I was a kid, um, his wife left him briefly. They got back together again. Um, and he was a, he was a taxi driver. <coughs> he used to come around. My dad was a taxi driver as well. And he used to come round to the house, um, and he'd bring his lunch with him. And his lunch was uh, a massive portion of chips, a large portion of chips, and pretty much an entire loaf of bread buttered. And he'd sit there and he'd eat, he'd eat this like chip butties like, constantly and, and pucker pies, and that was it. And that was all he really liked. He'd get, he literally would eat like a, a whole loaf of bread a day. Um, and she wanted to go out for like go for an Indian, go get a curry and stuff like that. No chance. He was not, he weren't having it at all. He, he had no interest in getting a curry. Um, he was just, he liked what he liked and that was it. Um, and he was reluctant to try anything new. And she got so annoyed with him and so, so wound up that she, she left him because she told him he was boring. Um, and to win her back, he had to start eating Indian curries. So like we went for uh, went for curries with them, and they're like he's like they're eating a, you know, started off with a korma, and then after about four years he's worked up to a tikka masala. <laughs> so. <clears throat> so I've heard horror stories about Indian food in India, and that would that would put me off a little bit, even in like nice hotels. We, we got a friend who uh, <coughs> used to work for um, was it Tata, the uh, the car company that took over MG Rover, um, or Rover at least, and he worked for them. <coughs> he did work for Rover, and then he moved he moved to Tata in the uh, in Marcello. Um and he used to go over there a lot to go and like do material testing and stuff like that, um, and he was. He was very much, I'll go out and I'll try everything, I'll have a little bit of whatever they're having. Uh, but he was, I don't know if it's, I don't know if our stomachs aren't built for it, if they're used to it over there or something like that, but he was, he'd literally, he'd, 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 he'd have the squits the entire time he was away. And it'd take him about a week to get over it, get it all out of his system when he came back. Um, And I don't know if that's like saying if he was perpetually eating in a dodgy place, <clears throat> or if it was just I don't know the, the the way the food was prepped or something. It just didn't agree with him. But that kind of that kind of thing would ruin a trip, wouldn't it? <laughs> I'm pretty. I'm pretty good with spicy food, but I like it to taste nicely. I don't get these people who they go out and they order the spiciest thing they can get their hands on, to, almost to prove that they can handle it, kind of thing. It's like if I'm going to go out for a meal, I want to enjoy the meal I'm about to eat. So something that's just going to be painful um, and and burn doesn't really have an appeal. Need to uh, group up in there. Oh, you asshole! Brush.
<laughs> Chilies are supposed to be good for your metabolism, isn't it? Aren't they? So I imagine that's probably why they slim, uh, slap them in the slimming world. bum is falling asleep. I've got some customer orders I need to prep and ZBrush Crash has just blown it out of me. So I'm going to um, knock this on the head I think and stop here on this sculpt for now. So we've got his clothes done, we've done his boots, his uh, jerkin, his uh, belt so next stream I'll do his weapon <coughs> so I might do this one possibly Friday we'll see jump in finish up his weapon get that sculpted and then actually finish him off shouldn't take too long because his arms are quite straightforward um, like gloves with a roll down and sleeves that's it we've got the mantle around his neck the little um, thanks bunker cheers mate We've got the uh, the wraparound, uh, his, his shawl thing, and his shoulder pads, and then his uh, his grumpy bastard head. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, so we'll do that. Um, get him finished like Friday ish. So I'm going to go offline. Uh, I'm going to do a few other extracurricular bits and bobs today. And yeah, don't forget to go and have a little browse on the web store, uh, lionstower.com, the lionstower.com, sorry. Um, go and have a little browse, have a little mooch, and if you throw 75 quid's worth of stuff in your basket, you're going to get free shipping worldwide. So, make sure you find a lot of stuff that you like. Okay, guys, let me just go and check and see if we've got a raid we can drop out to today. Um... Who is online today? We've got quite a few on. Do you know what? Red Straw Baby's on again, but she's only got one viewer today, so let's go drop in on her. Yeah, I'll, I'll end it today, mate. To be honest, I'm going to return the computer off anyway, so the whole thing's getting shut down in a minute. Uh, slash raid. Red Straw Baby. Okay, so check out Red Straw Baby's uh, artwork. It's just some fantastic uh, bits and pieces. So we're gonna go in uh, four, three, two, one, and let me just open her channel so we can see what she's doing herself. Thanks, thanks all, Stain. <coughs> 